What can a Minecraft map run entirely by AI characters tell us about the future of working in collaboration with highly advanced artificial intelligence? We're going to look at the OpenAI Strawberry update and yep. also the man arrested for creating fake bands with AI and then listening to their songs with bots story. No, this, is this. this is my favourite story. This is my favourite story. Resistance is futile. Welcome to the podcast. Where we explore what's happening with AI, business, automation and culture and ask, where on earth is all this going? So the Minecraft thing. I think anywhere. first of all, just to explain, just most people will know what Minecraft is, but just to be kind of clear, Minecraft is a, a, a weirdly blocky kind of virtual world. If you've ever, if you've got kids, they would have spent most of their life on it. Just building worlds, creating characters and running around. And it all looks like it's from the 1980s, but it's kind of, it's, it's cool. It's very creative. So that's it's kind of It's very creative. It's like Lego for the yeah. latest generation. I do wonder how the kids tolerate yeah. those graphics. Yeah, the, terrible. We would have killed for graphics that you can get in yeah. the 80s. And there they are going, no, no, I really want this blocky thing. But anyway, yeah. that aside, yeah. the project was called Sid and it was uh -huh. created by Dr. Robert. Yang, CEO of Altera, and they got, and you can help our audience a bit here, Jamie, with the idea of this, but they got AI agents mm. into the map on their own, gave them a constitution, and just let them build their own society. And if you watch the video on it, you can see what they got up to. Yeah. They basically had all sorts of mini agreements and contracts and so on with each other. Yeah. And it seems by and large built a peaceful society and uh, yeah i mean how much of that is well here's the one out of a thousand programs we ran that mm. worked i don't know i mean we don't know the behind the story obviously but uh but nonetheless what do you think it tells us about our future and collaborating with these sorts of systems and how is that helpful if bots could run civilization because really that's maybe useful if you want to set up a distant planet maybe but living here on earth right now i'm not sure how that helps us i think it's probably preferable to most of the politicians out there at the moment isn't it having bots running running things i don't know if you you know would you would you rather have i mean of course they're an easy target politicians but yeah uh, but i'm inclined to not ask open ai as a corporation for its opinions on what we should do as a democracy yet yeah. And I don't think I'll be convinced in the future either. So, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not in fa favor of that. But what, what about just the general principle of where this would fit? What sort mm. of use case could you see this, you know, becoming so, part of in the business world or in, uh, in society or democracy? Yeah. So first things first, I think it's to explain to people what's going on here. So you've got a virtual world with characters in it. So people can kind of understand that. And in the same way where you've probably seen online, I posted something a while ago, I think we've talked about it, where, where you get kind of two chat GPTs talking to each other. So it's literally two AIs, ask, one asks a question, the other one answers, and then they stick into a loop of talking to each other and having a conversation. And what we're talking about here is a system that's kind of done that on a larger scale. You've just basically plopped a load of characters into a situation. They're all like little mini chat GPTs. They can talk to each other, they can do things, and then time is sped up and then just see what happens in this environment so first of all it was fascinating and hilarious to watch because it kind of i guess in in some way it kind of made you hope or well, it made me hopeful for humanity because it's kind of like ultimately they were trying to do the the most peaceful thing they were trying to be good these little characters from what i what i remember but i but i guess that's part of the experience that we all have when we use chat gpt so with ChatGPT, it's always extremely complimentary. It thinks all my great ideas are great, which of course they are, and all my bad ideas are great, which of course they are. Of course, so it's, yeah, yeah and, it's, and in a sultry female voice, usually if you're a yeah, bloke, you probably yeah, pick that voice. Of course, just like of the course. ultimate validation. It's ridiculous. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so really, you can see why it's getting positive outcomes because I imagine. Well, I guess you're then getting to things like the bias of who programs these things and what what parameters it sets and things like that. But you can see you've got lots of positive layering upon layer of positivity. So ultimately, you're going to end up with something positive. I think it would be interesting to, um, and remind me, I don't think they did this, but if they were to throw in a kind of evil character or group of society within this world to see what would happen. Did, it, did they do that? I'm not sure they did. 
No, no, at least as far as I can see, they were aiming to make it as palatable as possible. Like I said, I, I wonder how many versions they ran before they got something that was nice to watch. But, yeah. um, so we it don't know. Be, but, but yeah, look, that could be interesting and how they dealt with it. It would be interesting um, to kind of, to kind of like, make it more like society where you've got some people who are maybe more right-leaning, some people more left-leaning, and, and you could explain to these bots that this is, you know, this is the kind of politics, this is your, your kind of values and things like this, and this is the other side. And then see what happens, because I think that would give you a more realistic view of what would would happen in life. But go on, sorry, go. On. I wondered if it depends on their parameters and what they were asked to do. So mm. if they were asked to create a harmonious society, then if that was the goal, they're probably yeah. going to be doing making decisions that head towards that. So yeah. uh, again, you can see that that's problematic already because if you have that in society you've got to have someone decide what the harmonious goal is yeah so straight away you're into politics right yeah There's no yeah. escaping it in the end one thing that has come up as a kind of radical solution to this and i heard it first actually from steve Keane, but i think this is an idea that's been kicked around by computer nerds for quite a while is the idea of creating uh, an intelligence that has its own end date or mortality where okay. it can it needs to survive like us and that gives it much more of a sense of priority and making mm. choices then becomes about what is best for long-term survival of themselves and therefore others which may mm. be much more of a closer match to our behavior than yes. they currently are where they're not aware that they're yeah. not even real so that's um but I don't know how far away that sort of thing is from being possible anyway or whether or not it, that can be simulated in them already. I have no idea. But that might be a solution. And then then the behavior would mimic what we do. But here's the problem with doing that. If you set that up as a normal thing, do we really want to be competing against machines that are also fighting for survival and resources? I'm not sure if that's a good precedent to set. I don't know. So I don't know how that <laughs> we'll actually lose. works in practice. We'll lose. We know <laughs> we'll that. Lose, the, the, yeah. we've, we've all seen the Hollywood movies. Um, yeah. I think that this could be something that would be useful, as I imagine is why they're doing it, to kind of simulate potential situations in potential environments. So if you're a very large organization, for example, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of, of people working for you, or, or a government or something like that you can you can give it it's, it's basically scenario playing out scenarios and seeing what might happen um, or of course war games so uh, same kind of thing there what happens if if we do this what's the reaction to the society going to be but so hasn't that's that been I, I done say, okay so to the level that that's been done are you just saying it could be more you know sophisticated so there's been mm. modeling for around for a long time yeah. more recently and and a I feel like I'm only talking about Steve Keen at the moment, but the uh, You're a Steve Keen fanboy, so it's okay. I know, I reckon. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> nonetheless, it's relevant. There's uh, his Ravel software is out, and uh, it's basically modelling a level of sophistication that's quite unprecedented because the the system dynamics, mathematics mm. behind it all is is totally different from modelling it based on a loose theory. It's like looking, it's taking all the data and going, this is the outcome you get if you pull this tiny lever mm. here this is just what you actually get from real data sources so to level we have to a level we have that already so maybe you're saying no we could get really granular we could go look here's what happens if you have these agents that are modeled on say real human beings or we yeah you know and we multiply them by this number of times yeah. and put them in a model together here's what happens yeah it sounds like it would be something that would augment what you've just described that, that steve's talking about and does maybe this now takes this to an even bigger level or or a more or a more granular level depending on how, you, how you're looking at it yeah, it's yeah, kind of it's starting yeah. to kind of make that even more specific and and better it's really interesting to to kind of to watch though what's going on yeah there. sure yeah um there's a live kind of crossover reference to this where the taiwanese this taiwanese activist this is going back mm. maybe two years now but there was the taiwanese government uh, was the, the the Ma government was put under pressure by activists mm -hmm. to to um, to engage with the uh, Gov Zero movement. It was called Civic Technology Community that organised large scale demonstrations against them. 
yeah. that culminated in a month-long student takeover of the Taiwanese parliament. So what happened on the back of that was that they'd created a platform whereby you could have more direct democracy that was amalgamating yeah. a lot of these democratic issues and then putting them in front of the parliament going, this is actually what the electorate want you to mm. debate and talk about. Am I right? You've read Th up on this right. as well. Yeah, so um, a slightly bigger podcast than ours called uh, Leading um, with Alistair Campbell and Rory Stewart. So they've just been interviewing the guy that... Uh, Three kind more of, kind listeners, of, maybe. maybe. Yeah, yeah, a few, a few more. Um, it really, really fascinating. So they're basically, as you say, that they're, they're what they try to do is take over the government or at least kind of infiltrate the government uh, through a protest, peaceful protest, I should point out. Then in the government, they would then bring up in the in the different areas of government the main topics that people wanted to discuss. As you said, they would live stream it so people could see what's going on. People could connect to this thing as well. Hundreds of thousands of people around the, around the, around Taiwan could connect to it and be part of it. But I think the really interesting point here is that the software they're using is looking for common ground rather than division. And in the other podcast, they talk about kind of social media and things like that. Social media and private private companies running social media, ultimately they want division and they want vitriol because it, it kind of drives looks, you know, kind of eyeballs and, and things like that. I'm just going to pause there. Can you Are you hearing what's next door? Because they're making a lot of noise. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, let's just uh, pause there. It's fine. I'll leave it's it recording, okay. think, but I'll just I cut think, it out. Yeah, I think, they've, I think they've gone. So you have this this platform that is always looking for common ground and it's it's doing that because a lot of the way that people interact with it rather than it just being questions and answers it's 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 verbose so it's asking how people feel about certain things and it's using that to kind of create and it's remarkable because from what what he said in the podcast is that you do find this common ground and actually because it's about feelings and how people emotionally feel about things all of a sudden People who maybe might just go rah, 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 you know, kind of blast stuff or just yes, no, black and white. It's they can see that other people are doing that and you get this kind of feedback loop of of a little bit of empathy, I guess, about other people. There's really, really, really kind of interesting concept. And now the guy, I think his name is Audrey Tang, um, is now the digital minister or was the digital minister of uh, of Taiwan. And this has become a big part of what they do and how they work. And I was listening, thinking, my God, this is this, this could be, this, and, and because of AI and machine learning, they're able to kind of use this data to kind of help with the decisions. It's like grown-up democracy. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what is it? Um, what is it about? What is it about the kind of democracy that we have, where it's representative only? That is a problem in, say, not just Taiwan, because that's a frustration level that lots of people have with democracy as it stands. And and fixing it this way, does that not create a different type of problem in, to, in the sense that it's more direct? Shouldn't, you know, representative democracy is supposed to be about these experts that know more about running governments and running countries? And shouldn't we be just using them and not even getting technology to help? Does this look like the death of representative democracy and the start of a, a new one? Yeah, well, I think I think we've all seen that some of the so-called experts. It depends whether you're talking about the experts or whether you're talking about the politicians. But the um, the ex the experts often are experts, but the politicians who are who are meant to represent and things like that. I think people are starting to get. I know we're veering off kind of AI here, but 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 people are, I think, getting a little bit fed up with the the um, selfish drivers of these kind of things and some of the corruption more and more corruption that, we're, that, that we've seen across the world and actually i think it's time i would agree it's time for, for the people to be more involved with it you know they're at the coalface you know because that's the other thing you start getting into class and elites and and, and things like that you know in terms of who's who should be yeah. making decisions about about uh, about people so i'll try to bring it back to the ai but have a think about this conversation i had with a friend recently who was very keen to see a change in government recently. Mm -hmm. Fine. It's democracy. I, and I would like to see more democracy and involvement and people talking about it so without fear or favour, to be honest with you. But her take on this kind of thing, when I was saying, well, can we not have a situation in which technology facilitates 
more involvement in democracy and getting everybody don't have to vote but everybody who wants to vote should vote more regularly than once every five years mm -hmm. and get involved you know if that was yeah. possible yeah. why would that be bad and she was like kind of mimicking the churchill comment about the best argument against democracy is a five minute conversation with the average voter it was <laughs> was like she she just thought look we need representative democracy to protect us from a bunch of these idiots yeah. and i was like the, it's like a, a muscle if we don't yeah. train it if we yeah. keep saying to people you can't be involved we need to keep you away mm. they have less and less agency then guess what mm. they get more and more angry it becomes um, a self-fulfilling kind of yeah, uh, prophecy absolutely and and we just start to think that everybody's horrible and i think that is part of the problem mm. you get a situation though like in uh, Northern Ireland where what was observed after the Good Friday Agreement was that people who had been formerly bitter enemies and I think politically they still are, let's not pretend mm -hmm. were forced to then talk sensibly about how to fund schools and hospitals yeah. and, and create programs and that is the thing that made it work and of course yeah. until it didn't, there's still uh, yeah, still yeah. Problems, but it's but better than it was. Better than it was. Oh my gosh, it is. And so yeah. the observation there is just that when you ask people to start making decisions with with actual money and resources, then that changes the equation. And that's what's missing is it's all too abstract, and you end up with these very polarized camps of people who are just like all politicians are scumbags, mm. uh, all, uh, all everyone's corrupt, and it's all the private sector are all bad or the government are all bad either way. It's always that polarizing. In actual fact, as you get into it more and more, and I worked with my wife on a, I didn't work on the campaign, but I helped my wife, supported my wife who was um, working on the campaign to elect someone um, in our local area. And, you know, people who are trying to get elected are genuine. You know, yeah. they have whatever you think of their beliefs, they're genuine in them and they're trying to do what they think is the right thing. And that's yeah. what's happening and then it's getting distorted. So yeah. it, it gets distorted in the way that the um, uh, people go into power then and are forced to accommodate all sorts of lobbying efforts and so on. Yeah. It's not easy for them. It's not. It's too complex. So we should be able to intervene better and technology, bring it back mm -hmm. to the AI thing. This yeah. What I saw when this came up was the possibility that we might be able to to use technology better uh, yeah. to help inform not only um, people being able to talk directly to each other and work out results, but also maybe see some patterns and get to... 100%. You, you, you were talking about this earlier before we started. What was your take on on the idea that, that there could be a democratic f format in which a lot of input from from us in natural language could then be interpreted and turned into a pattern or something like that. Just yeah, that's, that, that's exactly, so that's exactly what uh, this guy, um, Audrey Tang did. So they used, there's a few platforms. I think one of them is called Pol Polis. Um, sounds like police, but it's not. And it's, it's a, a, it's an open source. So they're very much about open source. It's an open source platform, which basically uses verbose language to be able to understand what people are thinking and they're feeling um, to answer certain questions that are that are put up there. So a little bit, think of it a bit like Wikipedia. So Wikipedia, you know, being a wiki, everyone can contribute and ultimately you should end up with the, the truth in inverted commas, but you should end up with a, a, a consensus. Yeah. Um, and this works in the same way. And the AI part of it and the machine learning part of it is looking for the common ground. It's looking for the the things where people are agreeing, where they're, they're agreeing that this is bad, this doesn't make them feel good, or this is good and this is positive. And surely that's got to be a good thing. That's, uh, look, I, I would bring it to, uh, you know, and it's, it's lovely. It's always interesting to watch American politics. But I think one thing that um, Kamala said, Kamala Harris said Never on a dull the debate. Moment. No, and if anyone watched the debate, that was hilarious. But the um, what she said, which I really, really resonated with me at least, is what she's trying to do. And on your point of a politician is trying to do the best thing is trying to bring people together rather than divide them. And obviously you see uh, the other side, Trump, you know, constantly, apart from talking about eating cats and dogs, um, because that's the others. The others are doing that. So it's, it's creating a bridge rather than trying to create walls. And I think that should be where we're going. And we can use uh, well, the technology to, to help that. And there's an engineer in there somewhere in that mix, of course. And well, not one, lots of brilliant engineers they need to come up with formats that are 
going to end up being political at some point mm. because yeah. all of this information gets fed through a lens of some sort, which is designed by an engineer. So and on you this... could argue that um, I'm not a, very much of a relativist. I, I see Trump as inherently dangerous, regardless mm. of the fact that his platform of policies, actually, when you look at them, are like it's, there's a lot of things there that are they're just policies, right? Mm. Individually. Yeah. So, but uh, but I see him personally as dangerous because he's just not just incompetent; he's just a narcissist and dangerous. Yeah. So yeah. that um, that I think it, what I'm saying is, um, is at the moment we're stuck in a personality cult on yeah. either side, and we've asked being asked to vote at least if you're American for personalities, and that, that presidentialization is happening here in the UK too. Yep. What this technology potentially does, I hope is remove mm -hmm. the need for a lot of that where yeah. it's not like we don't have people involved but we can have a lot more people involved that yeah. are all and that power is dissipated and that's yeah. a good thing and i think this is the weird thing on the trump side in the states a lot of the communication is about removing the power of not just the president but the government mm. right yes yeah bringing it down and that let small government the, small the government. whole point is to go in and um and and reduce that amount of power now of course hidden behind that is a pretty libertarian agenda which yeah. is uh reduce the ability of the state to take money and taxes off rich people i yeah. get that that yeah. is definitely going on yeah um but nonetheless there's a genuine agenda supported by a lot of people on that side which is mm -hmm. how do we not have all these this endless amount of interference in our personal lives and how can we yeah. get on with it um better or make make quicker decisions and with less bureaucracy etc which is there was not a, there was, it's not crazy at all no and there was there was i was listening to um lbc yesterday and there was a really really interesting discussion so in in the uk government you've got uh labor in power with keir starmer and there was a big review yesterday about the nhs basically it's an, it's in a dismal state it's, it's lots and lots and lots of things wrong with it and he was stating there's, there needs to be a kind of a 10-year plan to really try and turn this around and do what needs to be done but I can't remember the exact language that he used, but he said something about the population needs to be invested into this as well. And what he meant by that, as it was described, is that this is a this is a two way thing. You know, you everyone wants there to be an NHS and a health service, and we all agree on that, and that would be great. And ideally, it should be free at the point of of contact, but but not, that's a, that's another debate. But on the other hand, we as individuals and society. Could, do, could be doing a lot more to reduce the demand on the NHS. So things like eating healthier, exercise and things like that. Now, what happens is, and it was funny listening to the to the radio, the same 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 radio show this morning or same, same channel this morning, but with a slightly different leaning presenter. So what you have is, I, I agree. I think, for example, a lot of sugary food and fatty food and things like that, it's, it, it's it, ultra processed food. We know it's bad for people. We know it creates all these these problems and diseases, and that puts a load on the on the um, the NHS. And so we know that. And and of course, there's lobbying by these companies because they want to sell their food. However, um, it's not doing a good thing for society. But what happens is you end up with a situation where, through social media and through these radio programs, where you get one load on the, on the one side saying. This is good. I think this is good for the greater good of society. And you've got others on the other side. I want my burger. Don't take away my Coca-Cola. You know, all this kind of thing. And it's too much government and they shouldn't be telling us what to do. But let's go back to this idea of a kind of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on this platform and looking for a, for a you know, a, a kind of common ground, which might be it's, it's really good having the NHS and it's really good, you know, that it could be free at the point of, of, of use. A common, that if that's what everyone wants, then you can start to build upon that. Do you see what I mean? Yes, um, I think the framing of it is is what gets used by platforms to promote the stuff that's divisive because it mm. gets more eyeballs. So basically, yes. what triggers you is a problem exactly. So if that's a social media problem, yeah. but it, then it has a precursor, which is the tabloid press, right? It has yeah, a history yeah, yeah. of working. This is the problem. If you want to have some fun, let's talk about the strawberry update because, frankly, yeah, I sent you a screenshot uh, early this morning <laughs> of uh, my first experience with the. It wasn't great, you know, was it? <laughs> How many hours are there in strawberry? 
and it's yes. like there's two. Uh, hmm, interesting. So that's that's strawberry update. We've covered that. Yeah, yes. But then I must admit, look, I don't, I never think that these systems are meant to be. What's the word? That that seems like it seems too flip and glib of me to just pass it off as being uh, not perfect because it did that on yep. your on your uh, end of it. It was worked fine when you asked the same question. But the point is. I use it not for those purposes and find it amazing. I don't yeah. use it to, to be super accurate. I nope. know that sounds bad. I'm appreciative of the fact that it's quite fuzzy because mm -hmm. what it does for, for a creative like me is quite remarkable. So let me tell yeah. you the experience I had after that. So okay. For those that don't know, Strawberry is the latest OpenAI update. It's also called, I think, one zero 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 o o one. the letter O-1. Yeah. Yeah, it's so really that's, rolls that's off the, the tongue. That's strawberry update. Yeah, exactly. So strawberry is the nickname, it seems. I think that was the project name that's yep. uh, got, it's been stuck with. So I, I was writing a – I was up early because just to, just daughter, Just kind of yeah. context again. So ChatGPT, this this is ChatGPT. This is their next iteration or part of their next iteration or a, pro, a slight side project which will, will ultimately become their next iteration of, of what we all know as ChatGPT and what we will use. That's it. So it's in preview at the moment, but um, yeah. if you've got, I think if you've got the paid one, you can yeah, get you access get it. to it. So I was writing a blog for my personal Substack, and I'd um, I was up early because my daughter was off to France, uh, so we were dropping her off, and uh, and I couldn't get back to sleep. So I started writing, and I was so for fun, I write about a mixture of economics, um, work, uh, future of working life. And, uh, and sort of issues around AI and automation as well. Mm -hmm. And I wrote for about an hour, got all these ideas down and I was moving things around. I couldn't quite make it work. And I went and used the Strawberry update to because it was deeper thinking apparently. And, and then um, I, I just pasted in what I'd written and it's all out of order and everything. I said, look, I'm struggling with this uh, because although I've got this central idea I want to talk about, mm. it's not becoming clear. So can you reorder it, do whatever you like, and make it into a blog? So it did. Yeah, yeah. And it was quite good, but yeah. it wasn't my voice. So I was like, well... It didn't okay. have your accent. It didn't have my accent for a start. Um, it could never get that. That's the, the <laughs> one thing that AI will never manage as a Kiwi accent. Um, and so I, I went and pasted in a couple of my blogs from the past. And I said, here's my okay. voice. Talk to me for a minute in my tone or my style yeah, yeah. and so we had a back and forward conversation for a bit and i was like okay now you've got my voice now go and rewrite the article yeah and then when it did that a couple more times a few more tweaks uh then i cut and pasted that and then started working with it so what i came out with was a version that i was very close to writing but i was uh -huh. stumped and it yep. didn't it stopped me from just going away and leaving it Yep. It's accelerated the creative process to finish point, and then I went through the whole thing and rewrote the bits that definitely yep. weren't me. And and the, hang on, that's not what I wanted to say, and so on, uh, which weren't many. I was quite impressed. So I think this is a step change, definitely. Yeah. Whether other that's my use case now. That's yep. pretty niche rewriting Substack articles. Well, but, I, yeah, I'm not sure. What I else use to... so so what I use ChatGPT a lot for exactly this stuff, and I think. Everyone does, or, or anyone who's, like you said, slightly creative if you're trying to come up with a uh, a methodology or an idea or a blog or whatever it is. It's very, very good. I use it uh, every day. I use it to bounce ideas off, um, kind of refine ideas, make me think about things that I didn't think about myself. Um, and funnily enough, when I was reading about the Strawberry release, what they were talking about in a blog that I was reading is that, is this whole point. So what Strawberry is doing is basically... A little bit more like humans do so rather than just kind of vomit out the response as standard gpt does chat gpt does it will think about it before it comes out so sorry i keep referring to trump but it's like trump i guess is, is the first version of chat gpt just vomits out what, what's on his mind um whereas uh the strawberry version is with the same level of accuracy i think yeah yeah with chat and um, strawberry version is is being more thoughtful about it so it's basically thinking so you and, and you can see it so it says you know you ask it a question it says thinking and then what it says is you can and you can drop down the thinking so you can see what it's thinking about it's quite remarkable so you can see it thinking okay i've said this i've said that um 
actually, I want to improve this. I would say revising, rethinking, doing that. So it's, it's imagine you're in a job interview and someone's asked you a question and you don't just splurge out what's not the first thing on your mind. You kind of conjugate it in your mind to give what should be the best answer. And that's what Strawberry is doing. So I haven't had too much of a chance to play around with it yet. Um, but what I did do before Strawberry was released, I've, I've got this new little thing that I do with ChatGPT, which I guess is the same thing, is you, you get ChatGPT to produce something. And then what you do is you say, right, I want you now to critique this. I want you to score what's been written here, what you've written here out of 10. You know, you are, a, you know, head of this division, blah, blah, an expert, blah, blah, blah. And then it critiques it. And it's really good. You can do that through a number of iterations. So I guess that's what Strawberry is doing because it's it's just reviewing and revising and trying to make better what its, it, what its kind of outputs are. Yeah, that was my experience. Whether or not it's doing the same thing before, but now it's just pausing and putting in these little things saying, <laughs> I'm thinking... I don't have know. you got have you have you noticed the memory thing now so i think this might only be applying to the paid version so and i really like this so what happens is when you when you're working with ChatGPT, it will say something like memorizing this or adding to memory and you can go in and see what it's what it's memorized and uh so for example i was with my son up in liverpool a, a month or so ago and you know we were looking for somewhere to eat and i was asking it questions about some good ideas of some stuff to do up there if I go and look, if I scan through the memory now, it said, uh, you know, Jamie is in Liverpool. Uh, Jamie enjoyed the Beatles museum experience. Da, 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 da. So it's now a bit, it's kind of weird. It's building this profile of stuff I've done. Doesn't sound stuff terrifying I'm, at all. Not what at all. Stuff I'm, go wrong? <laughs> stuff I'm thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine getting your hands on that for everyone. Wow. I have, I have tried to get that information out of, chat gpt like uh, tell me about the uh, this profile the, and, and that sort of stuff and it's like no no i don't remember anything i don't know what you're talking about it was <laughs> so i yeah uh, i mean it, in the same way that i think google has been somewhat responsible yeah in a good way for anonymizing how its data is uh you know mm. uh, conclusions are uh, arrived at does anonymize um, people so that your you know various searches are not being you, a profile of you is not being built in a way that um, that could then be uh, weaponized. Yeah, for want of a better word, right? Yeah. Is that going on with OpenAI? I don't know. So, I mean, certainly I, don't trust Sam Altman. That's, I trust him sure. more than I trust Google. I really do. I maybe I'm just an optimist. Well, he's. I mean, he's an. Okay. I mean, he's a very good salesperson for this mm. and he's attracting an enormous amount of venture capital, which is why the, the hype keep, needs to keep going. The, 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 the te- doesn't mean the technology isn't great. It is. But it's more the, the fact that does it justify this level of funding and hype and so on? I don't know. Um, well, depends. It's-, I don't, it, it's hard to know still exactly where it's being used even though i'm using a lot more i don't know am i am i times a million more productive and therefore we've got a higher gdp or something going on or not i don't know what the benefits really from all this are saving me half an hour on writing a blog for example yeah but i think if you were to i think i was at a meeting yesterday with a a client of mine a, a firm of accountants and the 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 main guy there he's he absolutely a bit like you and i use it all the time now for for you know i i literally use it all the time you know and and he was the same he says i do it for everything i literally do you everything with it and yeah. someone else there was doing the same thing so so this must be a reflection of what's happening you know people are using it and oh sorry can you hear that in the background someone's yeah yeah. yeah yeah which we have a chat with them yeah maybe the, maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's sam Altman. <laughs> Yeah, calling Listen, now. I heard you guys were talking about. <laughs> I was just checking out your memory, and Jamie, you, and I realised yeah, that, that you've you... got a huge platform. I thought I'd just get in there and just talk about how we're going to have AGI next week. <laughs> so, I think if you think about productivity, yeah, I think your productivity does go up. I would absolutely say my productivity's gone up. Things that I would have had to spend hours doing now take me, you know, just a few minutes to do. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, talking about AGI, or, yeah, I'm just or, playing or... devil's advocate. I just, I, I. I have to be skeptical because 
we're basically giving Eltman, among others, mm. the power of God to to yeah. do whatever they really want. And how do you know that if you assume you trust Eltman for now, mm. right? Great. I mean, okay. But how do you know that what we're setting up as a system isn't going to get taken over by somebody who's not as trustworthy as Eltman next time? This is the mm. thing. These are highly... When people talk about centralized power, most of the time they're talking about governments. But there's also centralized power in capital, only uh, yeah, yeah. automated systems like this. And, you know, I just... I worry that we're going to have to have a Cambridge Analytica style thing happen where mm. the information that you just talked about is cascaded somehow and uh, everyone loses control of it and it, or it's weaponized in an election, say, um, before we realize it's not okay having such a concentration of power in AI either. Yes, I, I may be over, oversimplified, but I do think, okay, OpenAI has a kind of free version, but that's not powered by ads and data are kind of selling your data and you have the paid version so it's so my simplistic mind this is a productivity thing we're paying for it that's how they're going to make their revenue ultimately over time you know the cost will go yeah. up and, and things like that so whereas the all the evil ones i think are powered by free but powered by free because it's not free your, the, yeah, I understand. You know, Go your data Google, Google, Facebook, so on and so forth, yeah. and Twitter and things like that. It's, do you know, that is a really good point. And so, you sound like ChatGPT. Thanks. <laughs> that is a really good point. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> um, is, is actually, this is me doing my strawberry impression, by the way. Really think, thinking. Okay, you're doing really it Really well, thinking yeah. hard. Yeah. Um, How many R's in strawberry? <laughs> 17 <laughs> so the 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 point being uh, if you if this is the start of a new internet let's yeah. say right yeah then we had this choice and kevin kelly articulated this really well years ago when he was starting wired the internet had a choice then which was are we going to go paid for or yeah. are we going to go advertising and, yeah. it, and for, for whatever reason, we ended up with the advertising run model, I think, because it was easier to get off the ground uh -huh. because getting people to pay for something they couldn't see the value of was harder. Mm. I think with, with AI, like you're saying, I was playing devil's advocate a, a bit there, but I am finding, yes, it's, it's a productivity gain. Yeah. Um, it's taking a lot of mental load off things, I think. Uh, well, just that, that is a productivity mental load, gain, right? Mental load, but, but just time. Yeah. Just time, time to well, produce something, yeah, you know, it's just... It's... And so if if it ends up that this becomes the new model where you're paying for access, it's not free, but you're not being manipulated and mm. the access costs are really low if they stay mm. kind of as low as they are. Yeah. Um, then yeah, you do end up with a paid for model, but one that isn't potentially as needing to be as manipulative. It does, you know, because it doesn't need to sell your attention. You're using I, I, it because it works. I, you always use the Microsoft and Google example, right? Is are, are Microsoft evil, and is Microsoft Office being used to manipulate you? I would that paper no. clip, I tell you what, that yeah, manipulated me into not it's, using Microsoft. Yeah, Microsoft. That's for sure. <laughs> but but I would argue that most people don't see it that way because it's you're you're paying for it. You pay a subscription. You you're getting the productivity. Google apps which are part of obviously the big google google kind of thing they're good lots of people use them there's lots of good things about them but in the back of my mind i'm always thinking why are they doing this okay they charge for it but it's it's lower they, they, are they doing that just so they can suck more information out of your emails and out of your your documents to target you even well not, not them target you but basically the people that pay Google billions on the advertising platforms, they they demand greater and greater knowledge about the eyeballs that are in front of them. And the way that Google can provide that is by really understanding what you what emails you're getting, who you're you know, what shops do you go to because you're gonna get emails from those shops and, and things like that. So that's how I that's how I've always seen it. Maybe maybe I'm cynical, but that's that's kind of how I see yeah. it. Yeah. It's an alternative way of 
of looking at it and maybe that turns out to be a good thing i mm. think it's healthy though to stay skeptical personally yeah. Uh, yeah. not because you won't be disappointed i think that is cynical but no because it's i, I think we're giving otherwise too much room for maneuver uh yeah. culturally right of yeah. course you and me personally can't do anything but culturally <clears throat> we should keep our skepticism about these mm. products and where necessary just to exert a kind of cultural revulsion to things that really are ick. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and so far, look, for, there's plenty of skeptics uh, and I read about them because I'm, I'm looking for the things that are important and wrong. But, yeah. but, but for all the skepticism, I then go and use OpenAI and find it really damn useful. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I find um, that the skeptics are not, are not showing me what, what I'm experiencing basically. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, so that's that's a good news story. Uh, well yeah, done. Yeah. On can I can, can I just talk briefly about convincing um, me slightly about that? <laughs> can I talk just briefly about synthetic data? Did we talk? I don't think we covered this on the previous uh, podcast. Did oh we? yeah. No, we haven't. But I did. I did see this. So the idea that basically there's a, a loop of like making data so that the so that machines yeah. can. <laughs> so this is basically the made up data. This, this makes yeah. Sense. So this is this is kind of linked to strawberry and, and kind of what what. Um, open AI doing as well hmm. which is they've pretty much sucked up all the data in the world already so they've basically hoovered up the internet they've got kind of the whole of humankind um, there and that's how it was trained because AI needs data to train it and that's how it can respond to you because it's using all of this information to be able to respond to you it's but they want to make it bored of humans now where else can yeah, it's we bored. <laughs> yes so it there's only so much it can do of that and it's growing constantly. So they need to constantly train it to make these better models. It needs more and more data to, to hoover up. So this, this blew my mind, right? So now they're using effectively ChatGPT to generate data, which then the next version of ChatGPT will hoover up and use to train itself. I mean, it doesn't sound possible, obviously. It sounds like pulling yourself up by your own shoelaces. In the <laughs> But so does that, uh, you know, and conceptually, have you got your head around that? Does that make any sense? Yeah. You are, you know, to me, what happens, that, I mean, that to me, that becomes a kind of, um, uh, what's it, the, the loop where it goes up the graph, an exponential growth. But it's like compound interest because now it's going to generate loads of content. It's going to learn that content, which makes it more powerful to generate different types of content. And it goes round and round a loop. And basically, this will be what destroys us. <laughs> so we can thankfully we can end on a downer after yeah, convincing that open AI a, might not positivity. be as dangerous <laughs> as I thought. You're fine with us ending the world on a feedback loop of data. Yeah. So give me a practical example of how they would use this. So if you were trying to create a model of say human behavior on the how people make toast, uh, okay. like what would what what goes into that? Okay. To give it its own data. Okay, so so at the moment, if you were to go into ChatGPT and say, "How do you make toast?" It would have learned, having scoured the entire internet and you know New York Times articles and 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 videos and content, basically content over the last however many years, it's going to get, give you an example. And say, "Here's how you make toast." All right? It's going to say, "You know, get the bread out, it's going to then toaster." Da, 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 da. So now imagine that you say to ChatGPT, "I want you to produce." Hundred, hundred thousand, or hundred million articles and di ways to make toast based on what you know already, but but maybe with some slightly different angles on it. You know, you different angles. So it now pre creates all this new content about toast and how to make toast, and then it goes to its new model and it says, right, I want you to learn everything that you've already learned about toast, and now I want you to go and learn from all this new content as well. So it goes back into this loop. So now when you go in the new model and ask it how to make toast, it might have slightly different ways of <laughs> making toast. Okay. And, I mean, I don't know if toast is the best example, but... <laughs> when I wanted something practical and also wanted to know if I could make toast better than I'm making it. You can always improve, Jamie. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, exactly. Toast yeah. is never a complete solution on its own. <laughs> right. I didn't to want go. to diminish toast. <laughs> <laughs> and finally... <laughs> Man arrested for creating fake oh. bands with AI and then listening to their songs with bots. This makes is $10 my, million. Dollars. What this, is going on? 
This is my favourite. Let me just bring it up here. Yeah, this is my favourite article. I sent this to you. I was just laughing to myself. So yeah, basically what this guy's done. So AI can now be used to produce music, right? So you're starting to see more and more of this about. So guy goes and makes loads and loads of fake bands with fake music. He loads it up into Spotify and just, you know, he, again, exponentially he can produce this. So it's lots of things. He then goes into Spotify because you get paid for your music being played on Spotify and then uses automated bots to listen to that music. So the, the listening numbers increase, increase exponentially and makes $10 million in the process. <laughs> this is fantastic. Clever guy. It's, it, it is clever. He's only cheating himself though. You know, yeah. <laughs> really successfully. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what's illegal about that. I wonder what the Fed seem to, yeah, the, 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 the fake attention. I mean, it is, it is fraud. I yeah. think pretty clearly fraud. Yeah. Because you're not but actually, he... you, well, there's advertising revenue that is being paid for f fraudulently. So yeah, I guess I, so. I think that could pretty, I mean, I'm no you know lawyer, that, but you know I, that I there's, think that You know that there's AI music already on Spotify being produced kind of by Spotify. Yeah, to, but, they're, but they're not then being put in front of bots. The, the point yeah. isn't the music. It's the fact that it it was the listening to and therefore earning ad Monetizing. Revenue. You're monetizing yeah. from bots. Have you, have you seen these Chinese kind of bot farms where they've got hundreds of uh, phones on these kind of racks that are basically aut doing this, basically automating things which generate money like clicks and things like this? Yeah, it's one of those things you've, I saw on a meme in, in Twitter and, and it seemed like a fever dream. I just didn't... I didn't want to know anymore. I was like, oh, okay, there's something horrible going on there. Yeah. Scroll on past. But yeah, no, what was it doing? Tell me. What What the... The, the, the phones. The, the, what were the Chinese the I can't remember doing? what it was. It was... No, it's basically, you know, there's these these little kind of side hustle things that you can do where it'll be like, you know, watch this advert and you'll get paid 10p, you know, and then oh, okay, and people right. do it to make a little bit of side money. So they've set up like hundreds and thousands of, of these phones basically doing that. And then making a pretty good ink, probably more than we make, Dave. That's what we should be doing. It's not hard, but I think it's more like the effort that goes into. I'm sounding like one of my teachers at school now, but the effort that goes into doing that, you could have actually done something really innovative. But like that is innovative. It, it's, 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 it's that. Okay. It's, it's, it's like you could say, you could argue it's, it'd be really innovative if we made cigarette factories way more productive and could produce tens of millions of cigarettes. I don't know, is that good for society? And then we're back to that conversation yeah, about right. do we let everyone be free or do we centralise decision making? So I think that's a good yeah. place to to wrap things up. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> as, as stuck as we ever were in that yeah. loop. One day machines will fix it all, I'm sure. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> and, and they'll know how many hours there are in strawberry. 17, 18. It's going up, inflation. Yeah. <laughs> Talk soon. Resistance.